What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of exciting and potentially upsetting news here if you're a V8 fan uh, to go over here this week. But before I get into all the news here this week, I first wanted to ask, have you ever thought why in the world is my wireless bill so darn high? Are you paying all that money for speed, coverage, data, access to 5G, unlimited talk and text maybe, or mobile hotspots. Mint Mobile offers all these features for as low as $15 per month, and I wanna thank them for partnering with me for this video. They're built on the nation's largest 5G network, and as someone who travels a lot, I know how important it is to have good, reliable 5G coverage, whether you're near or far from home. But how do they do that at these prices? They keep their costs low by selling direct to you online, no retail stores, no salespeople. So why should you pay more than you have to to get access to the same network? Go to trymintmobile.com slash Matt Moran, also linked in the description, to get premium wireless for $15 a month. And switching to Mint Mobile is super easy. Thanks to digital eSIM cards, which most phones now have, you can sign up and activate immediately right on your phone from the comfort of your home. And switching can be done in about 15 minutes. If your phone doesn't have an eSIM, Mint will ship you a new SIM card for free. Big Wireless wants you to think they're the only option. Don't be duped. Go to trymintmobile.com slash Matt Moran, also linked in the description, and stop paying more than you have to for your phone plan. I also wanted to briefly mention that I will be doing my usual Sunday night live stream at 9 p.m. Eastern time. It's always a great time. Join if you can. But getting into the news here this week, uh, like I said, uh, the first story is potentially a little upsetting if you're a fan of the Ram V8, because it is no longer going to be available here. So first off, Ram has revealed the 2025 refresh for the 1500 and brought some big changes in a new model to the lineup as well. But First, let's briefly cover the styling changes. So on the outside here, there's new LED lights on all trims uh, with the ones on the upper trims there getting those fancy DRLs there on the limited and the tungsten trims to be exact, which is the new top trim now. Uh, but even on the lower trims like the Rebel, the lights are smaller and sleeker than before. There's eight different grills, but they're all larger with bolder RAM badging. Out back, there's new taillights. And inside that tungsten trim uh, will be the fanciest, of course, with unique color combos, platinum metal accents with diamond knurling, a suede headliner, nicer seats with 24-way adjustments and massage, and a clipish, I probably butchered that pronunciation, reference pre premier stereo with 23 speakers, including a 12-inch subwoofer and 1,228 watts of power, along with a few other things. Across the lineup, there's also new digital gauges, a 12-inch touchscreen as standard, and a revamp to the 14.5-inch vertical touchscreen on those upper trims. It's also the first truck to offer a passenger display, which is a 10.25-inch uh, display and it's the same one we've already seen in the Grand Cherokee. Other tech is an available hands-free driving assist system and a 1.8 kilowatt onboard inverter both aimed at matching the F-150 which also has those features. Now let's get to these powertrains here though. There is no more V8s at all in any 1500. The base Pentastar V6 does carry over and the 3 liter Hurricane inline 6 engine is the V8 replacement. It's a turbocharged engine there and in its regular setup it'll do 420 horsepower and 469 pound-feet of torque which is 25 more horsepower and 59 more pound-feet of torque than the old V8. The high output version will do 540 horsepower and 521 pound-feet of torque and it'll be available in a variety of trims from the Rebel all the way up to the new RHO trim um, that Ram didn't show but says is coming in the third quarter of 2024 and they say that one will be reinforcing America's leading off-road and performance truck lineup. And the leading theory here is that that'll be the TRX hardware and styling but without the TRX's old engine and instead we'll have uh, this Hurricane 6 motor and be you know, like an actual regular Raptor competitor and be pretty evenly matched with that. So we'll have to see if that turns out to be the right theory or not but that is you know the thinking right now. That high output motor is capable of 11,580 pounds of towing by the way. There's also a new rear axle for these rams with the high output motor uh, that they say will enhance ride quality and then aside from the death of the V8 the biggest announcement was the new Ram Charger model. It's technically Technically an electric truck with a range extender engine, but unlike a plug-in hybrid, that engine can't power the wheels directly. It pairs a still massive 92 kilowatt hour battery pack with two electric motors, one on each axle for all-wheel drive, and 663 horsepower and 615 pound-feet of torque. Ram says it'll do a 4.4 seconds 0 to 60 time. There was no range given for that battery, but Ram did say you can add 50 miles of EV range in 10 minutes on a DC fast charger with a max charge rate of 100. 
145 kilowatts. Um, and with a battery this big, you could treat it like a regular EV and recharge it at home every night and never need the gas engine. But range is somewhat irrelevant for the Ram Charger because it runs a 3.6 liter Pentastar V6 strictly as a generator and is capable of keeping the battery topped off entirely on its own so that you effectively have unlimited electric range. So on a full battery and with a full tank of gas, they're targeting a wild 690 miles of range, um, which means the truck will keep going much longer than you'll be able to uh, with bathroom breaks and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's it's very, very impressive. It can also tow 14,000 pounds. And even when towing, Ram says the V6 is powerful enough to keep the truck running in that EV mode, uh, that it can keep up. Uh, of course, you'll have more frequent fill-ups, but they say that that V6 can keep that battery topped off indefinitely regardless of the situation which is actually pretty impressive i'm kind of surprised it's that capable um and so anyway you can also see the unique styling with the lighting that extends into the grill there along with the tail lights that are taken from the uh rev version um and the that's the fully electric version that uh, you know came out uh earlier this year and honestly seems a lot less appealing now that the ram charger is available i mean obviously this is going to be you know even more complicated having a full gas powertrain essentially aside from a transmission uh but a full gas powertrain plus you have all the electric stuff as well um and so uh but yeah i mean we'll just have to see you know how pricing works out for all these we don't have any pricing for these yet but speaking of you know pricing and availability the regular 2025 rams will begin arriving at dealers early in 2024 with the ram charger arriving either in the late third quarter or early fourth quarter they say of 2024 so about a year out for that one and there's no pricing for any of these yet but um yeah very interesting um i think this is actually a really good solution for people that are worried about the range thing um, but again having a real big battery pack means that you know i think a lot of people they want the range but if they actually lived with an ev and they do live in a place where they can actually you know park in a driveway or in a garage with this truck you know they'll find out that they don't need an enormous battery pack they don't need all that range 99.9 .9 of the time but you know for people who want to have that backup or want to do the towing or whatever this gives you the electric experience without any compromise and potentially could even be a solution for, you know, the apartment dwellers, street parkers, people like that, you know, that want an electric experience, but, you know, just want to have gas fill ups. You could never plug this thing in if you don't want to, and it'd be totally fine with that too. So a very interesting idea. I'll be very curious to see how, you know, Americans take this, how the truck market in particular takes this. You know, there's been these kinds of things in small things like the BMW i3 in the past um, that haven't been super popular. You know, Mazda has also been trying this here with the MX-30, also not very popular here. Over in Europe and stuff, I believe it is, you know, more popular, but we will see, you know, how Americans, uh, you know, uh, get used to this idea and whether or not they like it or not. But very interesting to see that. And thanks to the drive, we have some new rumors about the Dodge Charger and its potential power outputs here uh, this week, um, thanks to one of their anonymous inside sources. Um, so uh, the drive's new report here, um, you know, already says some of the stuff we already knew, you know, like we saw a few weeks ago, the leaks of the factory uh, pictures that show that it's going to have a transmission tunnel and therefore it's gonna be gas powered, at least for some version of the Dodge Charger. And so uh, we have a little more info on that as well as on the electric versions here. And uh, according to their reports, it won't get a V8. There's been some sketchy reports that it could still end up having some kind of v8 they seem to think that that's not the case uh, Again, we will have to wait and see but anyway so uh first up on the gas side here we'll cover that stuff from the report it supposedly will be getting 420 horsepower um in you know the regular base version with the hurricane motor with its you know base setup uh, and that there will also be a 510 horsepower high output version that'll be offered um and i guess that means they're saving the 540 horsepower variant of this uh, motor that's available you know we just saw in the ram maybe that's for a higher version or maybe you know the report or the insider was wrong and it'll actually be the 540 we'll have to see uh, but anyway so that's going to be, you know, the, I guess, spectrum they're going to be offering for the gas motors. And that's it, at least for now. Uh, so we'll see. But on the EV side, we already knew a bunch of the stuff. They already kind of actually gave us a whole hierarchy of like, here's what's coming. And there's going to be optional add-on packages you'll be able to do at the dealer to basically give you like a tune with EV and just, you know, give you a faster chip that you plug into the dash or something in order to give you a power upgrade. But as far as the base setups here for the EV versions here, um, so we already know they confirmed already last year that the base and mid-level versions will get 400 volt electrical systems and therefore slower recharge times um, for those ones. Um, and the targeted specs um, they laid out last year, some of, they just basically aren't going to be hitting those targeted specs. Some are beneath those, some are higher than that. But um, 
So if this insider, that's if they're correct, um, they're claiming the base car won't get as much power as Dodge had originally hoped. The base one will do just 402 horsepower uh, from a single rear motor, four rear wheel drive though, which is nice because that means you're going to have an actual rear wheel drive charger still, even with the EV powertrain, which is nice. I was expecting them to honestly probably be all all wheel drive. So it's great that we're gonna have a rear wheel drive version, but that is far off from the 456 horsepower that was originally targeted for um, that base uh, electric version. Um, but then anyway, the, beyond that, the middle trim that'll be um, offered supposedly will add a front motor for all wheel drive and it'll add up uh, to about 670 horsepower total for that uh, mid-level version, which for that one is actually 80 horsepower more than what Dodge had originally, originally at least claimed for uh, you know their, their plans last year. Again, these numbers could all be wrong from this insider, but this is just what the report says. Um, and then we already knew there was going to be a top Banshee version of this EV powertrain here um, that would get an 800 volt electrical system that was already confirmed, uh, but we never got a power number for that one last year. So the Drives Insider here claims it'll get 885 horsepower is the number here. Uh, so we will have to see. Um, but if this is in fact going to be a 2025 model year vehicle, then that means we are you know, running out of time for a debut for this thing. And we just saw the 2025 Ram and that's, you know, going to be showing up here with the Ram Charger version towards the end of, you know, 2024. So if they want to make this to 2025, I'm guessing we'll see something really soon. Unfortunately, it's not going to be happening at the LA Auto Show. They just already posted the schedule for the LA Auto Show and there is no Dodge press conference. So I'm guessing just like the Ram here, it'll just be its own thing, not connected to any auto show. And who knows when we will see this. But my guess is at this point, it's got to be sooner rather than later, especially if we already have stuff, you know, tooling up at the factory and all that. You know, I'm guessing this is really close. So we'll have to wait and see, but I'm getting excited. I'm hoping we get some official info here soon. Another electric sports car uh, that we now have a rough timeline for here is the next-gen Nissan GTR. And like I was worried about, it sounds like we're going to have to wait even longer than we originally thought. So I already covered the concept that they debuted in Japan a few weeks ago here. Uh, but Top Gear was able to speak to Nissan's head of products at the show who gave an idea of what we can expect and when we can expect it. Um, so... They already said that it'll be powered by solid state batteries, uh, at least for this concept. And this uh, report seems to suggest, according to this interview, that that is their plan for the next gen GTR. It will be a solid state battery EV only. There was talk in you know, prior years that it could you know still have some type of be a plug-in hybrid thing or mild hybrid or whatever. But it seems like they are going the electric route with it, uh, according to this executive here. Um, and while pre previous reports have said that Nissan solid state batteries could potentially be ready by 2026, it seems like that has also changed a little bit because um, it sounds like pilot versions of these batteries will begin production next year, but that for some reason they won't be ready for mass production in retail products until 2029 now, uh, supposedly. Um, and so the Nissan executive confirmed that the GTR needs to wait until the all solid state battery is out, it's stable and it's ready so we can go. And then he added also that um, with the density improvement, we can deliver a much better pack packaging that improves the aero and the overall behavior of the car while maintaining the 2 plus 2 layout. Um, but it sounds like we've got, again, at least another five years or so to go before we see a new GTR. Um, that's assuming the batteries even develop as quickly as they're now planning. It could even take longer than that. So um, yeah, you know, don't be in any kind of hurry for a new GTR. It sounds like we'll be sticking with the current one for a good long while. Hopefully they keep it in production at least. Um, surprisingly, this in 2023 here, uh, I guess because of the little refresh they did, sales have actually ticked up and they're the highest they've been since 2019, supposedly. So, you know, um, maybe there is some staying power here to the GTR, even though it's not large numbers, they're only selling a few hundred a year. But, you know, at least if that's enough to keep them around and justify it, I think that'd be great. I think it's taking on a new charm now as it gets older um, for its kind of old school feeling, uh, you know, funny enough. But uh, so we'll have to see. But anyway, uh, interesting to get that info on the next gen GTR. Uh, moving on to some regular gas powered uh, car news here this week. Uh, Honda has revealed the 2024 Ridgeline, which gets a refresh here. It's a light refresh. The exterior is the same uh, aside from the new tailgate with Ridgeline stamped into the back of it now and the addition of a trail sport trim and the trail sport trim is still pretty mild like we've seen with the other recent honda debuts just adding all-terrain tires a new suspension tune and a skid plate that protects the oil pan but there's no extra ground clearance or anything you know beyond that um the diffused sky blue paint is also new for the ridgeline here and it's exclusive here to the trail sport of course and the interior gets the biggest changes throwing out the seat mounted armrests in the center console from the last gen pilot and adding in a more ordinary center console and armrest setup it also finally gets the nine inch screen with a much better infotainment 
streamlined software compared to the very dated tech from the Hondas of the 2010s. It also gets the new steering wheel from the Pilot and the same half digital gauges as well. And I guess the bigger touchscreen, you know, from the Accord, we'll have to wait for a full redesign, which, you know, it's kind of interesting. We have the new Pilot on the new platform, but we're getting refreshes once again after we already got refresh in 2021. You know, for the Passport and the uh, Ridgeline here, they're sticking with this old platform, the old interior layouts and all that. Um, I'm guessing it's just they're a couple years behind on the development of those. And so um, it's just, I feel like it's kind of a tough sell when everyone knows the new Pilot is out there and it's, you know, the new engine and new transmission and all that in there. You know, it's to still be shipping the old stuff here in the Passport and the Ridgeline just seems a little you know, lukewarm to me, but, um, anyway, uh, you know, we'll see what ends up happening, but, uh, hopefully there is, you know, all these new Hondas get all the great tech we see in the brand new Accord at some point here, uh, relatively soon. Uh, but anyway, for those eager to update and just get the new interior, at least if you're happy with everything else with the Ridgeline, um, you're not gonna have much longer to wait because Honda says they'll begin arriving in dealers in December. Um, and strangely, Honda's been doing this recently. They don't have any pricing for cars that are going to be on sale in a few weeks that already have window stickers printed. They're not telling us the price yet still. I don't know why, but, uh, you know, bet on it being roughly around the same price as the current one, probably just, you know, a few hundred bucks more or something, hopefully. But anyway, interesting to see that. And Mini has an interesting uh, announcement here as well. They've uh, revealed the new John Cooper Works Countryman, but strangely, they haven't provided a model year for this vehicle in the press release. They just call it the new one, and, like, there's, it's all ambiguous as far as the model year. Production starts in March of 2024, but whether it'll be a 2024 or 2025 model year remains to be seen, because, again, they omitted the uh, model year here. Safer bet. In 2025, I think that's what I've seen for the European debuts, but um, we'll see what it is in the States. Regardless, uh, we already got a partial reveal, reveal of this vehicle a couple months ago on Instagram, but now we have some clear views here from all angles along with all the specs, and it continues to use the 2-liter turbo 4 and the 8-speed auto with all-wheel drive. It does get a power bump from 301 horsepower to 312 horsepower, but str strangely, torque has dropped from the old car's 331 pound-feet of torque down to 295 pound-feet of torque, and it's got a half seconds slower 0 to 62 mile per hour time as a result now doing uh, that time in or that speed in uh, 5.4 seconds now uh, it still sounds good though thanks to an active exhaust and it should handle a little bit better potentially uh, because it now runs 245 wide tires which is 20 millimeter wider than before there's also improved brakes and suspension and of course the uh, sportier styling inside and out and it'll be starting at $47,895 including destination we also have a clear look this week at the exterior at least of the 2025 Chevy Equinox, uh, thanks to pictures from China's regulatory government site that requires uh, manufacturers to publicly post pictures ahead of their debuts, which is bizarre, but um, those are the rules, and so everyone that sells in China has got to play by them, so it means we always get early looks at anything that's going to be on sale in China, and so it's safe to assume the U.S. version will be, you know, mostly the same here, um, and pretty much identical, and as you can see, it inherits uh, the design inspiration we get from the new Traverse here, even down to the floating roof design with the disconnected uh, C-pillar look there, and there's no other info for now, but the rumor suggests we'll get a debut here sometime early next year, um, which is a safe bet, and it's been sounding like it's going to be arriving by the 2025 model year, so probably we'll see it, you know, pretty soon. But anyway, interesting to see that. Ford has also debuted the California Special Package for the 2024 GT this week. And honestly, I'm just surprised that they are continuing this historical name since it seemed like with the 2024 Mustangs, they're going in this new direction and throwing out the historical stuff and just, you know, calling it the Dark Horse and all this other stuff. But seems like um, they're continuing on with the California Special, at least. We'll see about the other retro trims. But it follows the usual formula uh, of having a grill with horizontal slats, the side stripes, and unique wheels. Although this time there's no spoiler or focus gas cap which were staples in the prior generations um, the rave blue accents are also a new choice as well with the last cs having the red accents uh, i'm not sure i love the way they did those blue accents there especially on the grill but let me know your thoughts in the comments below inside it gets blue leather seats and wheel and it's available on both coupe and convertible again along with also being offered with the manual and automatic transmissions and this time you can even get it with a performance package if you want which is a nice inclusion and so the california special package is a two thousand dollar add-on and they're available to order now so cool to see that 
Porsche has also revealed the interior for the uh, new Panamera here this week, showing off a similar design to what we've seen already in the Taycan, complete with the three screen setup and the angled center console there, all surrounded by lots of piano black plastic, which uh, is an interesting choice. They're still sticking with that. But anyway, the full reveal will be happening on November 24th, and I'll be covering it more then. Uh, Toyota has posted uh, two more teasers this week, and we now know for sure what each of the vehicles are and when they'll debut. So they, they'll both be debuting on November 14th in LA at 10 p.m. Eastern time, which is two days before the LA Auto Show. And I'm happy to say that I'll be getting an early first look at these vehicles in person. Um, and so I'll be able to give you an in-depth you know, in-person tour of uh, both of these vehicles here. And so stay tuned for that next week. But um, so now we know the first one is going to be the next generation Camry. Um, and so for now, all Toyota is saying is that the Toyota Camry raises to new heights with no compromises. And the image shows that they'll be offering a hybrid version with all-wheel drive for the first time. Uh, but that statement almost seems to suggest a crown-like ride height. They're talking about raising to new heights. Um, yeah, that makes me a little nervous, but then the previous teaser image also showed a car that looked pretty low to the ground and pretty sporty. So we will see. I, I'm a little nervous, but they already have the crown. So like they definitely don't need two higher ride height sedans unless they just think no one wants a low sedan anymore. I don't know. We'll see what ends up happening. Uh, I'll be very curious to check it out next week and uh, report back. But um, the other one, though, is the Crown SUV. Uh, and the uh, better view here doubly confirms that it'll be the production version of the Crown Estate concept that was shown in Japan last year. Along with this image, this one, too, continues the same theme, saying, Come with us to new heights. A bold new adventure with Toyota Crown starts on November 14th. So, yep, yeah, stay tuned, and I'm excited to give you some coverage on that here next week. Uh, Subaru will also have a debut at the LA Auto Show. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have an early look at that one, but I'll be covering it at the show there. And um, they teased it with an image of a wheel and some cladding here, and all they're saying for now is that it'll be an all-new, fully redesigned vehicle. Uh, and the teaser page on Subaru's website shows forests, and so, um, you know, the Forester isn't the oldest vehicle in the Subaru lineup. That uh, honor is the Ascent. Uh, that one actually came out about six months or so before the Forester. Um, but it seems like the Forester is the safer bet for now. I'm guessing we'll see a new Ascent, you know, sometime, you know, next year as well. But I'm guessing this one's the Forester. Could be something else. Could be the Ascent too, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'll cover whatever it is new that Subaru is debuting next week. And Lucid this week announced that just like everybody else except for Volkswagen, um, they are also switching over to the NACS port here in 2025. Uh, and they'll be, of course, be getting access to Tesla supercharging network as well with that switch. And um, so, yeah, owners with CCS ports, of course, will be offered a adapter if they want, uh, you know, to get access to the superchargers as well. And so, yeah, um, again, Again, like I said last time, I thought this the Volkswagen was the last one. I guess Lucid was also an outlier, but now I think Volkswagen is truly the last large automaker to uh, not adopt NACS yet. So we'll see what they end up doing. But uh, very interesting to hear that from Lucid. And for the last news story here this week, Audi is formally saying farewell to the TT with the announcement of the 2023 Audi TT Roadster Final Edition. And it won't even make it to the 2024 model year. Um, also interesting is that unlike the iconic editions um, for the RS version earlier this year, this Final Edition is based on a regular TT Roadster with its 228 horsepower. And it does come in this exclusive and very attractive Goodwood green pearl color combined with brown leather seats though. Only 50 of these will be made and they'll cost $68,895 including destination. And if you want one of these CTs you don't have much time to act here because uh, these cars will need to be built before the end of this year if they're actually 2023 model year vehicles. Um, so uh, you know better act fast. They actually already removed the TT from the configurator on Audi's site so it's now just like a historical page. So the TT is officially ending i mean there's talk of electric vehicles and maybe one of them could be you know a smaller tt or something someday but it'll never be what it was you know a fun little turbo all-wheel drive coupe that's you know relatively affordable at least for a luxury you know sports car thing and so yeah i'm gonna just do a little cheers here to the uh to the tt and i got some canadian club here this week i uh, cracked open a new bottle recently and so for a little uh, little drink here for the tt so I always like the TT. I mean, I don't know about you guys. Let me know what you think about it in the comments below. But, you know, I always thought it was a cool combo, you know, especially the earlier years when it had a manual transmission with all-wheel drive and a turbocharged four-cylinder. That was a rare combo for a long time and continues to be, especially these days. But 
you know, I think the TTs were kind of underrated. They weren't the sportiest sports cars around. That's kind of why they always ended up at the bottom of the, you know, comparison tests and the rankings and all that stuff. But I always, I like the TT. I thought it was a great little car and uh, I'm sad to see it go for sure. So cheers to the TT. And lastly, I want to thank all of you that are members of the Matt Moran Motoring Club. So we did have two new members that were actually able to join thanks to Kyle's very generous gifting during the live stream here this past Sunday. And so first off, a huge thanks, Kyle, to you for always doing those, those membership gifts. I'm sure many of the members really, really appreciate it. I certainly appreciate it. And I really appreciate Yeah, I just really appreciate it. So I also want to give a big welcome here to the me new members here, uh, Jeffrey Fawzer and Dozer Shaw. Um, hope you're both enjoying those live stream perks so far. And I uh, hope to be able to chat with those of you who can join here on the Sunday live stream. It'd be great to chat more with you guys. And um, for anyone else who would like to join, become a member and get that priority answering that you get as a member, uh, there's always join buttons here on the video page, on the channel page, and also a link in the description. But anyway, thank you all very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts on all this stuff in the comments below. Be sure to also like and subscribe to keep these videos coming. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care and cheers.